Hello everyone, I'm Jim Daly at Daly Manufacturing. I'm here again with you this month to uh, give you some more uh, information and training. This is a seminar that we do both for our own employees and now we're doing it for a lot of other people as well. And you may be watching us live, you may be watching us later on Facebook or on YouTube or somewhere like that. But we're really glad to bring this information to you today. I think we have a very important topic. So what are the master nutrient? Why do I call it the master nutrient? Well, it's simple. Water is the nutrient that will make all of your nutrients work better. Yeah, if you take our supplements, you need the water because it will help them be utilized better. If you're dehydrated, you're not going to utilize your supplements efficiently. And we want you to get the most possible benefit from any supplement you buy from us. Now, we've talked before about nature's seven doctors. Uh, fresh air, good nutrition, pure water, sunshine, exercise, rest, and power of the mind. Meditation, prayer, relaxation, things that relieve stress. Well, <clears throat> these are really a checklist I use for myself or when I'm talking to other people because you have to do all of these things right or you're not going to have optimal health. I've loved that little book for all my life just about because I've really felt like it gave me the information that I need to make a good foundation for optimal health. Now today we're talking about just one of the topics primarily along with nutrition but the main topic today is Dr. Water. Now where there's water there is life almost always. Click one more time. Uh, okay that didn't work. Let's go back. This is supposed to be rolling ocean waves but since we're not doing this in PowerPoint it didn't work. I'm sorry. Anyway ocean beaches are one of the most inhospitable places on earth. In fact, you couldn't live on a beach really because you can't drink the water and survive. As an ancient mariner said, uh, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. However, there is a lot of life there and if you start looking you'll see it everywhere. In fact, any place there's water there's probably life. That's why astronomers look for life when astronomers look for life, they search for water, not for life itself. So where there is no water, as best we know, there is no life. There is life without sunlight. Um, blind cave fish. Blind cave fish have adapted to living in total darkness. And some nutrients come from outside uh, and are carried by the streams of water uh, to those fish. However, they themselves are never exposed to sunlight and they can't see. Their eyes have sort of withered away. But they must have water. How about oxygen? Well, there's a picture of a gastrointestinal tract. The gut is teeming with trillions of live bacteria. However, many of them are anaerobic. They cannot even survive in the presence of oxygen. Yet, to be active and multiply, they do need water. They can be dormant for a long time without water, but they will not survive forever. Now, I'll do one little experiment here. Let me grab this water and this. It looks like sand, doesn't it? Uh, well, let's put it in the water and we'll just let it sit there for a little while. We'll stir it up and just uh, we'll place it over here and see what happens. But I can tell you right now water is starting to attack the little particles of sand-like material you saw there. And But how does the water work? Well, we have a picture of it here working on a crystal of salt. Water is known as the universal solvent because more things are soluble in water than in any other solvent. Here you see a salt crystal 
dissolving in water. Now the water has a kind of a unique structure. It has two hydrogens and uh, oxygen and it polarizes with the positive charges over where the hydrogens are, the negative over where the oxygen is, and it interacts with a lot of other compounds. Here, those are interacting with uh, sodium chloride, and it's actually pulling apart those crystals and then pulling apart the molecule itself so that the chloride and the sodium are no longer bound tightly to each other. Instead, they've become ions soluble in the water. But that makes them able to work and react with other uh, ions as well. Calcium could go in there and bind to that chloride and become calcium chloride. Uh, for instance, magnesium could do the same thing. So it, suddenly, this goes from an inert crystal to a highly active substance. And that's what water does throughout your body. It's the medium in which all of the enzymes work, in which all the chemical reactions in your body take place. They're all dependent on this solubility in water. Now, chemical reactions in water occur uh, in plants too. It occurs in most life. Uh, here we see a picture of uh, photosynthesis in a plant, a uh, chloroplast there. Water is essential for the uh, biochemical reaction to make uh, turn hydrogen into oxygen and to make sugars out of the carbons that are there. And we see that actually water participates pretty actively in that uh, reaction. You see NADP going to NADPH on that slide. Well, that's because it's taking a hydrogen from the oxygen uh, from the water molecule and making a high energy molecule out of it. If too much water uh, gets there, however, the sub substrates are too widely dispersed and the reaction slows down. Too little, the reaction is too slow and eventually stops. So it has to be the right concentration of water, not too much, not too little. Water is also critical for humans. And we'll talk about that, uh, first of all, water and digestion. It's kind of obvious and, and really you didn't have to think too much that water might be important for water-soluble vitamins, right? For minerals, things like that that dissolve in water. That's obvious. Uh, it's critical for those things. However, it's also important for fats. Now, over on the right, you see a block, a big yellow blob there that says dietary fat. Well, what is that? It's a tri those are triglycerides. Now, this will get a little bit uh, difficult, I think, for you maybe. But let's try to get through this, what a triglyceride is. If you look up above that yellow dietary fat, you see the triglyceride molecule. On the left, going vertically, is glycerol. Now, glycerol has three carbons that can attach to three fatty acids. That's why they call it triglyceride. Now, that's most of the fat that's stored in your body. It's most of the fat that you eat. So it's a very common form of fat. It's also because there's so much fat and so little glycerol, it doesn't dissolve in water at all. However, your body's got to do something with that to make it a little bit easier to work in the more aqueous environment of the stomach. And water is essential in that process. So let's go back down below there. You see the dietary fat, and right under it is pancreatic lipase. What that does is pulls one or usually two of those triglycerides off of the glycerol, of the fatty acids off the glycerol. So the, no longer a triglyceride, it's usually a monoglyceride. Now the monoglyceride has an interesting uh, characteristic in that it's somewhat soluble in water and still soluble in oil. Now that's kind of the first step and I'll show you how that kind of looks. 
when you get the water and the oil in the body. Now, this is just water and oil, period. Now, I did this this morning. I did two of these this morning for you to see. I took water, put some food coloring in it, green, so that you could see the water better. And then the oil I put on it, and I stirred it around in this Erlenmeyer flask. And you can see it's completely separated into an oil layer and a water layer. So they didn't mix for long. They separated back out. And therein it lies the problem with fat digestion because it doesn't mix well in this aqueous environment. Uh, and it's not reactive. There's no enzymes up here in the oil that are doing anything. It's just sort of sitting there. So it, that's a problem. Now, in the stomach, however, you don't usually have just oil and water. You have protein. So I took another one, and this was eight hours ago, and I poured a little bit of protein in there. I took some gelatin and jumped the pack in there, and I swirled it up, and it all mixed together. And then you can look at it. You can see just a little bit of oil has separated over the last eight hours. But here's a mixture here that's sort of whitish, in-between looking, and down below is the water. So you've got this emulsion in the middle. That's where things really happen uh, with fat digestion. So you've got oil, you've got water, oil, and then this fat water emulsion in the middle. Now, look at the diagram again because <clears throat> this is going to really show you what happens a little bit better. When you get that mixture, the uh, liver releases pancreatic lipase. Uh, that's what broke those triglycerides up that we talked about a while ago. So that is the next step. I don't have pancreatic lipase in there, so you can't see it, but you wouldn't be able to really see it anyway. Now, step two, bile acids. You've probably heard of the liver bile. So that's the next uh, step in making the fat work in water. It forms micelles. The bile acids work as a surfactant, which makes these um, triglyceride, uh, diglyceride, monoglyceride, but primarily monoglyceride, sort of form into a unique sphere that goes down right to the brush border membrane, which is the bottom there of the uh, gut, and starts releasing their contents. Those fat micelles are a critical step in the digestion of fat or in the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. My cells are kind of like the packaging for fats. Now you can see over on the right there, uh, you've got your triglyceride uh, indicated, your glycerol as that red ball, and then the hydrophobic tail, which is the fatty acid that hates water uh, as the fat. And this forms a hollow sphere, not completely hollow, but hollow sphere in which fats can be stored, those fats that broke off from the uh, triglyceride can be stored inside there. Your vitamin D, A, E, K, uh, coenzyme Q10. All these fat-soluble nutrients can be stored inside of that little ball there, that hollow sphere, and then taken down to the uh, membrane, the brush border membrane in the gut and there they can come apart and be taken up and digested and enter your bloodstream where they're made into uh, chylomicrons, uh, into various fat-soluble, uh, water-soluble transporters for the gut. Now, <clears throat> Proper absorption of fat, therefore, is dependent on both fats and water, not just fat. 
And that's a key point. A lot of times people feel like if they take vitamin D, for instance, in an oil capsule, that it'll be better absorbed. And it may be somewhat if you just take that with water. That's not going to work well to take a fat-soluble vitamin with a glass of water on an empty stomach. You're never going to absorb it very efficiently. You'll get some of it, but not that efficiently. On the other hand, if you take it with that oil but you don't drink water with it, it won't go through this process of making my cells, and it won't, still won't be absorbed better. So really, fat-soluble vitamins should be taken with a meal that contains fats, proteins, remember we need those to get that emulsion we were talking about, and with uh, water all together. Then you can make these micelles in the gut and you can absorb these things. Obviously, uh, water is obviously very good for digestion, but what else? Well, it turns out kidneys. Water actually protects the kidneys. Uh, a study in 192 Florida agricultural workers found that 53% were dehydrated when they came to work. Now, they had to work out in the hot sun in Florida. So, not surprisingly, by the end of the workday, 81% were dehydrated. At least once a week, 31% uh, had tested positive for acute kidney injury which was increased by hotter temperatures due to greater water loss. That's not surprising. So we can see that really getting out, working out hard, and not getting your water can really harm your body, your kidneys in particular. Now, one question that's come up, it doesn't matter whether the water's cold, hot, or whatever. And that's a question a lot of people have had. Uh, does the temperature of water matter? Well. There have not been a lot of studies of that, but there was one study I found that investigated whether someone should avoid cold water in a hot climate. Is that too much of a shock for the system, I guess? Well, they concluded at least that there was no advantage to drinking tepid water and that there might actually be some advantage of lowering body temperature when drinking cold water in a hot environment. But most important, it was important that the water be palatable, palatable. So drinking what you like. And I'm going to get a drink right now, small one. My throat tends to get dry. Well, how about the brain? <clears throat> well, the brain needs water too. Now, kind of a funny quote here. George Bernard Shaw, the great Irish author and philosopher, wrote, no diet will ever remove all fat from, the diet, from your body because the brain is entirely fat. Without a brain, you might look good, but all you could do is run for public office. <laughs> okay, well, he was maybe right about the last point, but at the first point, uh, the brain is not entirely fat, actually. The brain is about... 78% water, has more water than just about any other part of the body. Um, but fat does come in second. Fat's important in the brain. The dry weight of the brain is about 60% fat. However, the brain is highly metabolically active, and all those metabolic reactions need to occur in that aqueous environment. That's why it has so much water in the brain. And dehydration really affects the brain. Uh, in a mouse study, they found that mice lost about 10% of their hydration of their brains as they aged. Well, 10% hydration is quite a lot. And they found that, but this happened in all the mice as, mice as they aged. Uh, they found that synaptic responses in brain of the mice as they got older and as they got dehydrated were about uh, quite a bit, anyway, quite a bit slower. This, uh, they just weren't quite as sharp as the, the young mice. However, the synaptic response was restored in brain slices when they rehydrated them. It suddenly came back to life. So that's something to think about as you're aging. 
you know, I don't know if there's any possibility that some people with dementia are really just dehydrated. It's possible. Uh, I can't say that for sure. I have not seen that study yet. I'd like to, but I haven't seen that yet. But it is something intriguing, and certainly we know that hydration is important for the brain. There was a human study uh, studying stroke victims and hydration. Early neurologic deterioration, uh, and it's sometimes called stroke in evolution, can occur after an acute ischemic stroke. You'll usually think about most of the damage from the stroke occurring right away when the stroke is, is happening. Blood's gone and, and there's no blood to the brain and, and neurons are dying. But a lot of times after the stroke has been resolved, there's still continuing uh, deterioration of the brain. Well, this group decided to look at hydration and see if that was related to why some patients had that uh, SIE, stroke and evolution, and some did not. So they took 445 patients and tested them after their strokes and tested them for dehydration by measuring urine uh, specific gravity. And then they rehydrated them if indicated. Well, it turns out SIE was lower by half in the rehydrated group. So that really made a difference in how the people uh, did after a stroke and how they survived, how they improved. Well, take a look just a minute at our sand well, it wasn't sand. <laughs> See how it's foaming up? It was just the water right about here where my finger is. Now it's foaming up. What's happened is all the little yeast in there, and what I put in there wasn't sand. It was Fleshman's yeast, like you'd make bread with. <laughs> okay, so it was inert. It wasn't active at all, it would seem to be dying. And it would die in uh, about a year if uh, you didn't do something with it. However, this uh, has suddenly, almost instantly come to life. Those particles of yeast, they suddenly were broken apart by the water. The water got inside the cells. The cells started their metabolic activity and they started multiplying. And suddenly we have this big frothing bottle that's about to come out of the, the beaker there and uh, of growing microorganisms. So that's wonderful. <laughs> now, let's go back to where we were. In this last study, remember, they checked the hydration of the subjects by measuring specific gravity of the urine. Now, that's something you can do if you want to. I think if you follow a good plan with drinking water, you don't really need to do that. But if you want to, if you find it interesting to see, you know, how hydrated are you after being outdoors and uh, playing sports all day or working all day or, or whatever. If you want to test your hydration, you'll need a little bit of equipment. Um, you can get a hydrometer to do it. Uh, and buy one, but if you happen to have one of these little things, it's a graduated cylinder and a, a balance to weigh it on scales that can weigh to uh, at least two, maybe three decimal points uh, in grams, you're in good shape. As it turns out, pure water weighs one gram per milliliter or cubic centimeter. Now, that's the standard for specific gravity of water. Everything is judged as above or below that uh, when you measure specific gravity. Now, specific gravity of urine should be a little bit above that of water. However, it should be less than 1.02. So if I filled this up with urine to the 100 uh, millimeter mark and I measured it correctly and look over on that right hand picture 
you'll see kind of a uh, upside down moon shape there. Well, where you measure that on the line for 100 milliliters, in this case, in the picture, 20 milliliters, is the bottom of what they call the meniscus, where the, you'll see that the liquid makes a curve due to the, um, the way the water attracts to the sides, the surface tension. So you want to measure it at the bottom of the meniscus. And if you don't get this pretty accurate, you're not going to get a very good reading. But um, put a, your urine in there, measure that, and then you want to weigh it. Now, if you do 100 milliliters like that, it should weigh less than 102 grams, and in which case you're reasonably well hydrated. If it weighs more than 102 grams, well, that's a very good indication of dehydration and what they used in that previous study. Now, like I say, you must be able to measure and weigh accurately to do that. Uh, another way you can do that is to get a cup, and they make what they call hydrometers, and you can put in in there and measure it too. They look like uh, they look kind of like thermometers, except they float in the water, and you can see where the water level is and measure it. So you can get devices to do it. Um, but make sure that you remember how to use that uh, graduated cylinder accurately. Another indicator of dehydration is dark urine. Now, sometimes you can take supplements that will turn your uh, urine bright yellow. That's not a problem. But if you haven't taken those recently, you have very dark urine, that's a pretty good indication you may be dehydrated. So that's not quite as reliable, but it, it is reasonably reliable. Hydration is also very important for exercise. Um, this study looked at hydration, which they defined as more than 2% of body weight loss in water. And you can actually measure your hydration that way too if you're careful. It's, um, if you, let's just say it's a person that weighs 200 pounds, okay. If you, after a bout of exercise, weigh below 196 pounds uh, because you've sweated and, and done all that, um, then you will have become dehydrated. Now, this study was a blinded study of bicycle performance in dehydrated male subjects or hydrated. Uh, exercise performance was tested in the same subject, either hydrated or dehydrated. Dehydration was confirmed by, in this case, plasma osmolality, which you probably don't want to mess with, uh, but it's a very good way of doing it, but you have to draw blood and all that kind of thing. Um, work was uh, completed was consistently lower in subjects during the dehydrated state. Now, if you look over on the right, the top bar shows before and after or uh, how much work they did at the end of the period total. And you can see there's a very significant difference. And every one of the subjects went from EU on the left is uh, U hydrated and on the right uh, hypohydrated, which is dehydrated. So you can see a very big difference in the work, which is measured by how much work they can do on a bicycle that measures their energy input. Uh, the bottom bars, they show that right at the first, there wasn't too much difference between the two groups. But as time progressed, it became a bigger and bigger difference of how much they could exercise. So you see that dehydration really affects your ability to to uh, do good exercise and to perform at a high level. Well, then the question becomes, how much should a person drink? Well, how safe is water, first of all? Because you don't want to hurt yourself. And honestly, one or two people a year literally die from drinking too much water. This is something that can happen. Um, 
what happens when you do that, your body can eliminate about a liter of water per hour if you have good kidney function. Okay, that means you've got to go to the bathroom a lot, but it can do it. However, if you start drinking, you know, a lot more than that, your kidneys don't get rid of it. It goes into the cells of your body, your tissues. It messes up your electrolytes. You can suddenly be urinating out a lot of electrolytes. You're, if you're doing a lot of exercise, you're losing them through sweat. But also you're diluting them as the cells swell with more and more water. But what really gets people is this happens in the brain too. And the brain can't swell much without getting into real problems. So most people have brain injury and some die from drinking too much water. Um, now, as you look at that, water is way down the bottom of dangerous things. If you look at the top, botulism toxin is not very safe at all. It only takes 0 0.00001 milligrams to kill 50% of the people that uh, would get that dose. That's what you call the LD50 rate. Uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, in fact, it is so toxic, you could hold enough in your hand to kill everybody on the planet, literally. Now, you'd have a hard time to distributing it all equally to them to do that, but you could hold that much uh, botulism toxin in your hand. However, we do know that doctors uh, give people shots to reduce their wrinkles of botulism. So it's a really, really dilute dose, no doubt about it. But there is a level of botulism even that's safe. And that gets to the first rule, foremost rule of toxicology. It's the dose that makes the poison. You can see the aflatoxin is a lot more safe than botulism, but still pretty bad, and it will destroy your kidneys. Vitamin D looks like it's pretty toxic there, doesn't it? I mean, it comes in uh, pretty early in that, but 10 milligrams of vitamin D is a huge amount. If you translate that into international units, that's one million international units. So there again, dose makes a poison. A 70 kilogram man would have to take 70 million international units of vitamin D to reach that LD50 level where 50% of the people would die. So you don't have to worry too much about that. That's not likely to happen. Although, because vitamin D does have toxic potential, that's one thing that we take extra care in in testing to be sure that we don't ever get that mixed up because people have gotten into trouble when uh, companies, the worst being actually a pharmaceutical company, have gotten the calculations wrong and given people much, much higher vitamin D than they were expecting to get. And uh, back probably 30 years ago now, uh, several people died from uh, accidental overdose because of a manufacturing error by a pharmaceutical company. So it can happen. It has happened. Um, but, you know, it's very unlikely that people uh, will die. And, and these accidental type things, the only situations that I'm aware of where people have died from getting too much vitamin D, uh, in fact, it's really rare that anyone dies from vitamin D or even gets it's sick from it, so don't worry too much about that. But remember, everything is toxic at some level. Everything is safe at some level. The dose makes a poison, and you really have to concentrate on that. Now, water could be, it's probably, the LD50 of water, that gets up to about uh, six quarts. Um, quite a bit. Now, if you spread that out over a day, it, it wouldn't be that toxic, probably. But if you take that in a short amount of time, you're going to get into trouble. In fact, drinking even one gallon of water in a short amount of time uh, is probably not very good for you. It's likely to do some damage. But how much should someone drink? Back to that question. 
You know, when I was growing up, we heard eight glasses a day. Uh, some people have said 10. That's what's in the picture. However, making a th rule of thumb like that really does not make sense. Um, it, it's, logic tells you that eight glasses per day assumes an eight-year-old child needs the same amount as a you know, 200-pound grown man. Uh, that's not logical. So adjusting for body weight makes more sense. Uh, if a person uh, is very overweight, however, it should be adjusted downward from body weight because fat does not have much water associated with it. So uh, if I weigh 150 pounds, which is probably my ideal body weight about, then I would uh, need to adjust for that. However, if I gained a lot of fat and weighed 300 pounds, should I drink twice as much water? Well, not really, no. I should probably drink much closer to what uh, that 150 pounds is. Maybe a little bit more, but not a whole lot. Now, as a general rule of thumb, Dr. Kerry Reams, and a lot of people agree with him on this, including myself, said that half your body weight in ounces is what you should get in a day's time. Okay, so if you weigh 150 pounds and you're not overweight, then that would be 75 ounces per day. That's pretty reasonable. Uh, you may need to adjust it upward. If you're really outdoors in the sun all day and getting dehydrated, then you probably do need to adjust it upward. But unless you are in some kind of extreme conditions, that's about right. However, some people may have trouble keeping track of how much they drink. Well, we've got a solution for you. And these just came in. Now, these are water bottles that are actually pre-measured in four ounce increments. You can see up here 32, 28, four ounce, uh, 24 ounce. So if you fill this up to here, you need and a half an hour to drink this much, half an hour to drink that much. Because again, Dr. Kerry Reams recommended drinking four ounces of water every 30 minutes until you've gotten your right amount for the day. So that's going to help you. These nice uh, poly pure mountain sports bottles are safe for your water. And for most people, two things of this a day will be about what you need. Uh, so this has everything you need for measuring your water consumption. I like to keep one at home and one here, actually, because I have a bad habit of, of walking off and leaving them. So what I do is I'll fill up the one at home in the morning, and I'll get down two or three places before I leave, and that's fine. When I come back, I'll finish it. Meanwhile, during the day, I'll do one of these whole bottles at work, and that works for me, but you come up with your own system. And as a bonus, on this other side is all these instructions, how much water to drink, uh, how, how to do it. So if you don't remember what I said, you can read it all right here. And boy, look at how our inert uh, material is growing in that water. So those little cellular organisms really love water just like we do. Um, but, you know, water is so important. It saturates our entire body. It makes everything work. And um, a lot of people talk about detoxification. There's nothing that detoxifies your better, body better than proper hydration because you're able to take all of these toxins, all the salts, all the leftover protein uh, debris, they're all able to flush out of your body properly if you have plenty of water. So there's nothing I think more important for your health than to get the right water and the right amount of water. We recommend distilled water, which is the purest and cleanest you can get. It does not flush minerals out of your body, as some people will tell you. Um, that doesn't happen. But it does give you clean, pure water that will keep you healthy. 
and make those vitamins you take from us work. And I thank you for being with us today. And come back next month. We'll have another talk for you. I don't know what it will be yet. But look forward to talking to you again. And goodbye. Thank you.